автоматично йдеться добре. Мар'ян, тікай звідси. Все, Романе, починай, бо вже трансляція йде в YouTube. Ага. Так, одну секунду. <кій> Точно пішла вже трансляція? Так. Гаразд. Окей. Hello everyone, good morning and good afternoon. I'm starting today's uh, session. This is going to be the ninth uh, bi-weekly that we are running and uh, this time I'm in the airport uh, with my family and uh, we just checked in so I'm, uh, I would like to apologize for the side noises that you might be uh, hearing on the side here. We are finishing our promotion tour for the world to rebuild rural Ukraine in the United States of America and returning to Germany. However, uh, we never uh, want to reschedule or cancel our bi-weeklies. So I would like to uh, make to go through the main points today and to provide the update for you because there were some very important events over the last two weeks. Uh, I'm starting my video my uh, presentation okay and uh, oh. so uh, can you see it please let me know yes yes thank you so <clears throat> uh, first of all i would like to tell you that this slide is not included but when i woke up there was a very bad news uh, Russia has uh, bombed the prison or the institution where they captured the warriors from Azovstal, which were which surrendered, and until now they were captured by Russians. So they exploded the, these barracks, including the personnel of barracks, and including all all those who were captured. Uh, they got. Uh, badly badly wounded and 40 of them according to the latest information have died and at least 130 are uh, wounded are injured of course russia claimed that this was done by ukraine but we have already seen the official statement from the ukrainian forced uh, ukrainian armed forces they said that all the missiles that they are applying that we are applying they are extremely accurate and that has been proven by uh, over 50 uh, storages of uh, uh, ammunition that uh, had that have been destroyed over the last months and also uh, all of them are traceable so each of the missile or uh, not the missile we do not have the missile we are using the high mars and each of the uh, high mars launches can be traced very well so uh, if which I think it's not going to be the case. If it were Ukrainian side to launch it, the world will know it. And uh, also another cluster bomb landed uh, in Mykolaiv. And they, uh, this bomb, I'm sorry, please turn, turn off the uh, uh, microphone. Let, let me... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off the microphones uh, so that we can uh, proceed without the echo. Uh, so this cluster bomb, it landed next to the bus stop and uh, more than a dozen people were injured. So the first information was that 15 people were lying on the street after this explosion. Uh, no more details have come out so far. This is how uh, Russia is uh, saving and rescuing the civil people. Anyway, now let's get back to the 
presentation and to the facts that we have prepared for the team for you today. The line, the war line or active uh, war line in Ukraine equals the distance from Warsaw to Barcelona. This is uh, including the, the part that is still safe, uh, relatively safe. Yeah, uh, so this part uh, has no active uh, war going on, but the active part is equivalent 1000 kilometers. For you to understand, 1600 kilometers, this is one mile. So it's a huge distance and Ukrainian armed forces need to, first of all, watch the line that is still not active, but can become active. This is from the Belarus side. Secondly, they need to hold on the pressure of Russia on the thousand kilometers, which is an active line. So the last, latest news, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian forces uh, have the priority to retake Kherson. Kherson is a very Ukrainian city and it has never uh, even looked towards joining Russia, but now they are preparing to the referendum or to their elections uh, in order to join it to the rest of the Russian territory, just like it happened with uh, Donetsk uh, Republic and uh, uh, Luhansk, so-called national republics. And the uh, poll, the elections are planned for September, uh, mid-September. Uh, here lies the political uh, side of things or, or political uh, component. Uh, once the uh, Russia, according to their legislation, which is still exists, although they, it is very unique. So according to the, their legislation, once they accept these territories, they have right to protect them with nuclear weapon. And therefore, once uh, they uh, run the elections and uh, accept the territories, it will be much more harder to retake these lands. So what Ukrainians are doing with using uh, with the usage of the uh, HIMARS, they have uh, a couple of times uh, slowly uh, shot and uh, shelled the bridges. There are two bridges. One is the uh, bridge for cars. The other one is for the rails, railroad. So uh, they did. Uh, there was a couple of attempts to destroy it, and uh, my thinking is that it was done on purpose to allow Russians leave. But instead, Russians had the order, the political order, which uh, said you must uh, capture and uh, uh, stand still in Kherson. Therefore, seeing that Ukrainians are receiving the weapon from the West, Russians also decided to support the. Uh, troops that are already there, the Russian troops. And uh, uh, now that the Antoniv bridge, uh, the car bridge is not functioning, they have laid some uh, concrete panels on the uh, railroads bridge. It was also damaged, but not that severely. The, uh, tr uh, the trains cannot pass through it, but well, now that they have laid these panels, the uh, uh, heavy equipment can. Uh, and um, they are bringing more and more troops. I don't know why they're doing that, but this is a, by all means a trap for them because with HIMARS, uh, with uh, these 10 or 12 that we already have, we will be easily able to shut them down in the, as it uh, called in the, uh, these days, the SEC, not, not the uh, pot, just like they were trying to do for Ukrainians. Uh, the port uh, in the military, in the Russian military slang, it means that they surround their uh, opponents and they shell them with uh, uh, artillery. So they kill. Uh, the sec means that it is surrounded. There is no way but one road. And this one road is to surrender. Therefore, uh, uh, Ukrainians have created this sec and they're about to close it. Uh, hopefully good news will come soon. Uh, in return, or instead on the other side, we had to refuse of some lands in Donetsk, and that's the largest 
the uh, uh, hydro power station, uh, unfortunately. But again, this is done for the security reasons because uh, these uh, objects that are they are strategically important, uh, especially taking into consideration that we will be retaking our land in those areas. <clears throat> so uh, here are some facts that I was talking about, about this Antonio bridge and Kherson Oblast. Uh, so these two bridges, they are the only way for uh, them to leave towards uh, their, not their territory, of course, the territory that they have occupied. And here, this is, uh, uh, they, they are holding it strong here. Uh, but the river does not, land. there is no way they could be evacuated by the helicopters or helicopters would supply them with artillery. No way. They can only surrender or start swimming, which is uh, the, the river here is very wide. Uh, and uh, of course, destroying of this car bridge has radically decreased the supply of ammunition and weapon for them. Uh, Unfortunately, also the food and uh, uh, pro uh, products, therefore Ukrainian forces need to move quickly because the people here will uh, be the first to feel the effect of like, lacking the supply, food supply. Again, I'm saying it that Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. We have enough food, but due to all these actions, we have a lot of people that are isolated from the supplies of that food. I will never forget how at the beginning of the war, the uh, CEO of Harvest uh, said to me that they have a dairy factory, dairy farm uh, within a couple of kilometers from Mariupol. They were enabled by all means to bring that milk into the city, but they were pouring it into the soil, into the fields. In the meantime, people in Mariupol were dying from starvation. They didn't have even water. They were melting snow. It was early in the spring. Uh, so uh, regarding moving towards Kherson, here you can see how the territory that they are controlling looks like. These green parts are the territories that we have freed from them. As you can see, the priority for us is this uh, direction. <clears throat> Uh, I've already mentioned that within one month of usage of HIMARS, thank you, all the allies that are supplying, those are not only HIMARS brand, but uh, some are HIMARS, others are equal to them, like licensed uh, uh, analogs, but still uh, we are supposed to be receiving about 20. Right now we have a little over 10 or 12, if I'm not mistaken. But of course, these numbers are not... Uh, to be spoken where, while they are being delivered. So we received the information after the equipment has been delivered already. Uh, <clears throat> so these 50 uh, warehouses, they were a very precise uh, shots with minimum uh, damages. For you to understand, one of them was done nearby uh, the uh, nuclear power station and it was, uh, it targeted the tents, uh, the camp, of uh, Russian occupants, which was detached to the wall of the actual power station, but the uh, um, uh, rockets, uh, these artilleries, uh, uh, ammunition, it landed directly into the camp, but has not touched the uh, nuclear power station. <clears throat> As of right now, these are the losses of Russian army. Again, I would like to remind you that this is uh, offic official information coming from Ukrainian side. And not all of the bodies of those dead are uh, have been identified. It is the general observation taken into, into consideration the uh, uh, in, uh, all the intelligence coming in. So uh, if you are uh, following the Western uh, data, it would be less because they uh, require the proof of the death. Uh, <clears throat> so the war has, uh, uh, as I always say, uh, agricultural fields are the second battlefields in this war. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, uh, actions uh, of uh, outrageous actions that Russians are taking is burning the fields with the ready to harvest crop. Uh, this is done on purposely because uh, otherwise it wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't shift 
to the burning uh, uh, missiles, artillery, when the uh, crops are ready to harvest and they wouldn't be targeting the fields. So here are some of the uh, cases, the nearest cases that uh, occurred with these fields being burnt with the uh, crops already there. <clears throat> uh, also, unfortunately, uh, in the closest to the active war line zones, uh, farmers trying are trying to harvest, not all of them. I've heard myself that some said, uh, I will not uh, take my equipment to uh, to the outside to to the outside from my uh, storage my um, buildings because uh, Russians may uh, target it or they may just steal it if they come over here. So in those occupied areas, farmers tend to some of them tend to leave the harvest for the sake of uh, storing and keeping safe their equipment that they still own. So in Dnipropetrovsk, one of the um, uh, harvesters, while working in the field, uh, was um, uh, shot by the tank. Uh, why would the tank shoot deliberately? We already know because those were the cases in Bush and Irpin when people that were trying to evacuate in the cars, civilians, were shot by the tanks. The same thing is happening here, unfortunately. <clears throat> Again, the fires of the fields. These are the, the, just the facts for you to understand how often they are taking place and uh, how, un, how intended these actions are. So it's, it's not by mistake. We know that Russian artillery has, uh, uh, is, is the second probably to the last uh, in the accurateness, but uh, even with their ac accurateness, this is not the case to claim that it was done by mistake. They deliberately burned the fields. And I will tell you a little bit later uh, some of the ideas why. Again, in Mikulayev, 230 hectares, which is about 550 acres uh, burned down of the wheat uh, with, with the average uh, yield of uh, six tons. Let's make it five, okay? Uh, you can count what are the losses. Uh, unfortunately, and this has uh, has long been that we didn't see uh, the cases like that in Andreevka village, which is Kiev region, Kiev oblast. It has been freed up from uh, Russians about in about the end of uh, March. Uh, a tractor blew on the anti-tank mine, so there are still lands in Kiev oblast, Kiev region, that are uh, dangerous to work in. Uh, Kharkiv Oblast. Kharkiv Oblast is a very severely shelled region. Hardly any land is captured by Russians. Uh, there is some, but not much. Uh, so there is no, not, not long wait for our troops to proceed towards the borderline between the countries, but uh, they are too close to Kharkiv itself. And of course, the villages, the people working in the fields who live nearby uh, Kharkiv, they are suffering. You see, he was trying to uh, hold the, to, to uh, thresh the, the hay uh, with the tractor. Uh, in Dnipropetrovsk region, this is one of the uh, central regions, but it is uh, uh, in the reachable distance to the artillery and, of course, unfortunately, to the missiles of Russians. Uh, so you can see that the uh, combine exploded uh, in, in the oblast uh, on, the, on July 26. Uh, July 25, uh, the missiles hit agricultural enterprise and burned down their uh, storage facilities. Nobody injured, but the commodities got burned. Uh, to continue the topic that we've mentioned, uh, uh, that Russians, they follow the same policy in the wars, whatever wars they have uh, uh, run or um, caused, uh, they follow the same uh, sc um, stages. Uh, first, they target the military objects, then they target the hospitals, uh, then, of course, the storages of uh, ammunition and uh, fuel. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, next ones are the schools. So they understand that uh, the universities and the education is very important for people to 
see the truth and to be able to think this is not what they are looking for for their uh, for the territories that they are occupying because there will be too much of uh, uh, pushback from the uh, population just like it is happening right now in Kherson. for you to understand there is a uh, uh, yellow uh, uh, stri stripe uh, this is the movement, the rebellious movement. They are exploding. They are putting uh, explosives into the cars of those who betrayed Ukraine and are supporting Russians right now. And uh, the actual occupants, the military, uh, they are spreading the information uh, as much as possible about what's going on in the world uh, for the reason that Russia has shut down all the internet uh, services, of course, uh, uh, they're showing only their TV channels, no Ukrainian uh, television and no Ukrainian uh, uh, reception of Ukrainian uh, cell phones. That's, uh, that's in Kherson Oblast. Uh, uh, in Donetsk Oblast, again, uh, they, the sky attacks from the sky uh, to the civil objects, not to the military. Uh, not uh, for the purpose of proceeding with the uh, taking over the land, but just with the purpose to scare the population. Uh, Nikopol. Unfortunately, Nikopol is the town that is within the artillery uh, reach uh, distance uh, from the active war zone, and uh, it is the city, the town that is probably third most attacked by Russians after Kharkiv and Mykolaiv. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, and that's, that's been said by their officials for a couple of times, that they are targeting the civil objects for the reason to uh, bring, uh, to make them frightened and to uh, force Ukrainian armed forces to surrender. And uh, uh, the purpose is, uh, that soldiers, they rely on the people and they do what the people want. So if the people will start asking them to retreat for the sake of saving their lives, uh, people's lives, soldiers will not, uh, at least they will lose their, uh, uh, the, mo the motives or uh, the, the psychological effect will be a strong, negative psychological effect will be strong. However, that's very important, just recently, and this information came within uh, the last two weeks. Ukrainians uh, proved by the poll that was done throughout the uh, territories, of course, unoccupied, that 84% of Ukrainians do not support giving off the land uh, for the sake of stopping uh, this war. 84%. Uh, it has been long ago since Kyiv Oblast, the region around Kyiv, uh, has had any attacks from the sky because Kyiv, uh, that's a very serious, uh, uh, close territory to the Kyiv, suburbs of Kyiv, and uh, they are, uh, these territories, they are very much, very well protected, just like Kyiv. Of course, uh, like not 100%, but like higher than 80% of all the missiles are being uh, uh, stopped before landing. However, in Vizhorod uh, on July 28th, seven missiles were fired. So out of seven missiles, there is a high risk that some actually hit. And that's what happened. 15 people, they didn't die, but they were injured, unfortunately. Uh, Kropivnitsky, center of Ukraine. This is uh, the oblast that is even more Hello. to the north then Dnipropetrovsk, uh, the, the Mikulayev, I'm sorry, uh, over Mikulayev. However, they hit the hangars of the academy. This is the flight academy of National Aviation University. And uh, there were people who died. Uh, some of them were military, but only uh, one or two. Majority are civilians. Uh, again, Every day, unfortunately, Mikulayev is being attacked. I will not be going through in details because our topic, main top topic is agriculture, but still for you to understand that although uh, Ukrainian war has probably come off the, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, although the war in Ukraine has probably come off the first, the front pages, the situation 
is getting even more hotter in the uh, meaning of actions or actions in Ukraine. <clears throat> So there was a calculation of the losses uh, in Bucha. If you uh, remember, I mentioned, and that's one of the reasons why we have started the World Tribute to Ukraine project, the losses to the uh, uh, people's uh, houses and premises in the villages are huge. And this is one of the villages uh, that everybody has heard of, Bucha. Yes, it is a uh, close to Kyiv village, which is considered to be uh, non-agricultural, but rather uh, residential. And uh, it is it had a lot of nice uh, houses and apartments, uh, but the losses were calculated as $191 million. Uh, the same thing was done with the uh, uh, Moschun village, which is more of the uh, agricultural village further from uh, Kyiv, it was $33 million. Now let's go to the agricultural matters. We are harvesting the winter uh, crops, the crops that were planted last year, the winter crops. As you know, uh, they were already in the fields when the war started. Some of the farmers didn't have an opportunity to provide uh, fertilizers and to do all by the technology of production as it was scheduled for the security reasons. So the, uh, some of the acres were left unharvested or just are not safe to be harvested. And of course, some of uh, the uh, yields are much lower than it was expected. So the total uh, from, let me remind you, the total Ukrainian uh, agricultural land or farm farmland is 28 million hectares, which equals to 70 million acres. So out of this area, out of 28, a little bit over eight is was under the winter crops, 30%. This is the usual case for Ukrainian farmers. And then if the winter is unsuccessful, the, it goes lower because some of the he hectares are replanted. In this unique year, it went lower for the reason even that they were not able to replant just because their fields were destroyed. <clears throat> As a result, 25% uh, of the land for the spring season was not able to be planted. That's not included the acreage of the uh, winter uh, crops that are being harvested right now. The reason why I'm not providing any numbers because farmers are still uh, deciding. They have a very important decision to make whether to take the risk and harvest or not and leave it in the fields. Why? Because they don't know if the treaty with Turkey will start working and if they are able to sell because the current prices that they can sell wheat for or winter crops, small grains for are not applicable for the business. They are lower than the break even point. <clears throat> so we have planted a little over 14 million hectares of spring crops. Last year, it was 3 million hectares more. Quite a significant number as for the uh, total production. Uh, here are the numbers. I'm repeating some slides because there are people who haven't been to the previous sessions. These numbers have not changed. This is the breakdown on the acres uh, for each of the crops that were planted in Ukraine this spring planting season. First is spring wheat, spring barley, spring uh, canola, oats, peas, corn, buckwheat, uh, millet, sugar beet, sunflower, soybeans, and potato. You can see the mid circle, it shows the percents from those acres under this crop in 2021. So majority of them are lesser. The most uh, reduced ones are spring barley, spring um, uh, peas, uh, sugar beet, and potato. The structure of the crops has changed a lot. The farmers tended to shift from the high volume crops the crops that require a lot of care 
in the post-harvest and the crops that are expensive to produce that require a lot of field passes. Therefore, corn has lost a lot and uh, uh, other crops like small grains uh, were dominating. But usually small grains, they are planted as winter crops because winter crops has good yields. Spring, uh, spring small grains are very rare and uh, mostly they are planted by the smallest farmers in order to supply some food to their animals. So the farmers that World to Rebuild Rural Ukraine is trying to help right now. These spring crops, they are targeting their uh, market. <clears throat> this, these are the changes in the acreage for this season planting in spring crops. You see uh, spring wind uh, more, the reason because they shifted from corn. Sunflower uh, is less, but corn is one million less. That is a huge amount to be considered to, to influence the market. So uh, here is the uh, forecast, forecast for the uh, spring uh, crops uh, harvest season. You see blue, it is year 2021. Uh, the forecast that was issued officially by our uh, grain uh, association uh, on in the end of May and on the uh, green one is in the end of, actually at the beginning of this month. You see in most cases it is a little bit better, but, uh, but for soybeans, oh no, even soybeans is higher. Yes, it's a little bit better. Uh, probably the reason is that uh, our weather is uh, not that severe as it has been in a couple of years before 2021. 2021 was the best year out of the latest, maybe five to seven. Uh, so before that, the, the average uh, weather uh, was much more uh, harsh on, this, on the crops than this year. So it is more favorable right now. Uh, grain production in, uh, uh, and exports. So green is the uh, gra grain produced. Uh, brown is uh, forecast that was before the war. Uh, and black is forecast after the war started during the war time. Uh, the actual exports uh, forecast before the war and exports after the war. You can see the changes here in the columns. And that doesn't include the occupied areas, by the way. Uh, so <clears throat> the future planting season. Now let's talk about the winter uh, crops uh, planting season for the year 2023, for the seasons 2022-2023. It is being decided right now. There are a lot of forecasts, a lot of experts are shifting their opinions. I have tried to screen majority of them, but I rely on what the farmers say to me. And I must say that the most probably uh, representative was the uh, words of our team member uh, Denis Serhienko last year, last, sorry, uh, by weekly that he uh, talked, uh, uh, he said that he will not be considering harvesting corn until spring uh, if the situation with the market does not change. Instead, he will do his best to harvest, first of all, sunflower, then the oily crops and uh, uh, wheat crops uh, to be uh, placed in the storages uh, that used to be uh, uh, equipment uh, garages, so flat flat storage. As a result, the planting, uh, the acreage that will be used for planting, you remember I mentioned at the beginning of today's uh, session, usually it is 30% from 70 million acres, so 30%. Now it might be 20% to 15%. The uh, crops that uh, are going to be planted, the acres are, that are going to have winter crops planted. It means that winter wheat, winter canola, and all the winter crops will, uh, the uh, production will be reduced. So these, these are the steps that are actually bringing the world to this for, uh, food crisis that uh, Russia is creating and uh, experts worldwide were predicting. Not this year is going to be the worst thing. 
the next year after these seasons get we get results from these seasons uh, so planting uh, this year's house will be half as much as uh, 2021 this is the prediction for the spring crops half usually we had uh, about 60 uh, million metric tons to, to export but yes. uh, uh, excuse me please could you turn yeah. off the microphone i'm just emailing you <laughs> Excuse me, uh, nice to hear you, but yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, so, and for the full uh, field work, uh, in order to make the full uh, winter crops planting season uh, happen this fall, Ukrainian farmers need uh, uh, up to 90 billion hryvnias. It means that within a being not able to sell the commodities that they have right now, this is another very serious uh, push for them to refuse mm. from the from planting this uh, year. Excuse me again, the microphone. We are having a special effects and sounds. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Winter crops harvesting season uh, this year. So what have we all, what, what numbers do we have right now and what have we already harvested? As it is uh, officially stated, so about 18% is uh, harvested, 2.1 million hectares. You remember they planted uh, 8.4, it seems to me, uh, last year of winter crops. Uh, here is the breakdown on uh, what, how many of the crops have been uh, already harvested. Stolen grain. That's the problem that has started uh, with the second probably step of the war. So once they occupied the territories, they brought their, their military and secondly, they started stealing. They were stealing the uh, whatever they could, uh, the uh, long queues towards Crimea from Mykolaiv and Kherson Oblast were uh, uh, noticed of uh, trucks taking uh, stuff to uh, from Ukraine. And uh, only in those two oblasts, uh, as of mid-June, it was already estimated that 50,000 tons of grain was stolen. That's mid-June. Right now we have end of July. And their logistical chains have been refined and have been improved, unfortunately. We've had a lot of cases, I will not be going through them, of the journalists and their intelligence uh, noticing the cargo ships uh, with uh, uh, most likely Ukrainian grain coming to the ports of Turkey, of uh, Syria. Uh, but what they do, they, uh, uh, they rely on the fact that the Western world cannot, uh, make, um, cannot claim that they are uh, uh, they have stolen this grain if they do not have the proof. And if they turn off the GPS trackers, there is no proof. Great Britain said that they will help us with uh, identification of this grain uh, by the gene, uh, by the genetical test, but so far it's, it's not working. Um, hopefully in the future. Now, uh, Mariupol, you have heard a lot of uh, about this support. It has been mainly used as the port for taking out uh, iron and metals because there was this factory, uh, steel factory. Uh, the agricultural commodities were a minimum. Therefore, it was, by the way, during the attacks, uh, damaged a little bit, but not much. They're trying to fix it and to make it uh, uh, suitable for exportation of uh, agricultural commodities. So, uh, Russia, we uh, tried to analyze and uh, what's happening in the political side of things here with Ukrainian grain. And uh, here's uh, some ideas that we've heard from the officials and from the people uh, that are in this industry that to our opinion makes most uh, sense. So Russia usually sells about 30 million metric tons of wheat of grains. This year they came, they will sell about 
So every is 30, this year they want to sell 50. How often does it happen in your fields? You, you know how to produce and how different can be the yields, of course. But from the average, which is usually in the United States, 200 bushels, how often does it happen that the next year for, uh, it goes to 300 bushels? Hi everyone, it looks like uh, Roman has some problems with connections. Let's wait for him for five, 10 minutes. He's in the airport and tries to connect back. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes. Yeah, something happened with the internet, so I reconnected to my cell phone. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Let me return to the facts here. Uh, one second. So uh, it is impossible uh, in the uh, nature to reach such an improvement. Uh, therefore, we conclude that the Russian Federation is considering uh, justification of all the grain that they are stealing from Ukraine uh, to in order in order to be able to sell it uh, uh, to the markets. Of course, European countries uh, will be reluctant to play these dirty games. But right now, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Lavrov, he is on the tour in the countries of uh, Africa. Uh, of course, there are a lot of official statements that uh, they, uh, the reasons uh, why, they, why he is there, but, <clears throat> and it is proven by the recent news, he is also negotiating the, the trade of the grain. And uh, uh, of course, their market has been uh, fine-tuned or tailored for 30 million tons. This year, it is going to be 35 to 40% higher. They need to find new market. And the sanctions, they luckily... Uh, were uh, dropped for Russia, so they will be able to sell all those 50 million tons unless something happens <clears throat> outrageous. And uh, as a result, just two days ago, Egypt came out with the decision not to buy Ukrainian grain from Eridon, and uh, this is the Ukrainian uh, trader, and uh, another company. Of course, this grain was supposed to be uh, shipped in March and, uh, and April, but due to the war, it didn't happen. But uh, everyone so far were understanding the conditions that Ukrainians are in, and uh, uh, there was nothing happening there. We were just waiting for the ports to open and to fulfill our obligations. But uh, they have uh, turned down the contract, uh, claiming that uh, this is the uh, unexpected uh, situation and there is no such point, such part in this contract as the un unexpected uh, like uh, get, uh, acts, acts of God or something the, the uncontro uncontrolled situation so as a result uh, at least 240,000 tons of Ukrainian grain uh, will be instead sold to Egypt by Russia. Now the prices, the prices, uh, I've used this uh, slide before, 
but I would like to uh, stress uh, a new uh, information here. So uh, let me explain uh, this table first, and then I will provide you with the numbers uh, in the last column. So the prices in Ukraine were pretty similar for the commodities before the war as the world market market prices. These all are the metro, metric ton prices. Right now, uh, it's, here is the spelling mistake. Uh, these are the prices right now in the Western locations where the grain is taken across the border or to the port directly. These are the prices in the world for these same commodities just across the border. For example, sunflower. We all know that Ukraine is a number one producer of sunflower. Therefore, being not able, being uh, unable to export our commodity, there is a massive shortage of this crop that results in huge uh, jumping, uh, skyrocketing price. You see, within the months of war, it went up from 735 to 2100. And let me provide you with the uh, numbers uh, that the farmers are selling it in the central to eastern Ukraine. So those are even lower. So sunflower is 12,000 hryvnias. Let's uh, divide it by the uh, current uh, exchange rate. It is 38. It is 315 dollars. So sunflower in central Ukraine, just for the reason that it must be transported to the location at the border where it can be sold 560, it is uh, 315 in, in their location. Now corn. Uh, ah, corn 4,000. 4,000 hryvnias. It is 4,000 divided by 38, it is 105. You see, it is 170 in the Western part of Ukraine and only $105 in the central. Barley, barley is four, uh, it's three, 310, so uh, 3,100, I'm sorry, divided by 38, it is $81. Barley in central Ukraine is $81, whereas even within the borders of Ukraine in the West, it is 173, more than twice. Canola, 1250, okay, 12,500 divided by 38, it is 328. Canola, well, probably the price went up. This is the the uh, the first case when it it is better. Maybe this this price is not very accurate. Okay, wheat three hundred uh, thirty-eight hundred thirty-eight hundred. Uh, it is hundred dollars, two hundred and twenty. And soybeans. Uh, I'm sorry, soybeans. Uh, they cannot sell in central Ukraine. Therefore, the numbers for soybeans are not provided. With these uh, prices, you can imagine how difficult for farmers it is to make business and to survive, no matter what kind of farmers, uh, what size of farmers they are, big, small, or large, or average, I'm sorry. Okay, now, uh, um, grain export. This is the breakdown of the portions of the export uh, of agricultural commodities of Ukraine, Russia, and world. You see, corn, we are very significant. Wheat, we are a little less significant than Russian, but uh, again, around 10%, 10, 12%, that's the uh, usual. And sunflower oil is 50%. Of course, Ukraine will be influencing the prices worldwide. So, the export. Now let's go to the most dramatic, interesting, and uh, uh, the topic that brings most attention. Since the war, we have uh, exported 25 million, uh, uh, we have had 25 million uh, uh, metric tons of commodities in our storage facilities. You have been hearing a lot of numbers from 20 to 28. My understanding is that 
Ukrainians, having had so many troubles with government in the past, they tend to lower their numbers. And I've heard that from the farmers that I've been traveling with and I'm working with always. They uh, are reluctant to provide the true numbers of the crops that they have harvested. Therefore, at the beginning of the war, they said at least 20 million. Now they have a more accurate number, 25 million. As a result, they have exported 7 million over the months of war. And this is starting from, let's say, 1st of March. So March, April, May, June, July, five months. We were able to export almost 7 million, 6 point something, usually minimum of 6 million per month before that. Therefore, we are left still with 18 million metric tons of commodities to be exported. And it is worth, as of the prices, July 25, uh, over $10 billion. This is a huge amount in order to support Ukrainian currency. So this is how it is very all tied up with the, uh, the economy is tied up with agriculture. Let me remind you, 40% for zero, this is the money coming from the agricultural expert, 40, almost a half. And that's taken into consideration that Ukraine exports a lot of ores and a lot of uh, uh, natural uh, deposits. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, in July, starting from the, uh, so from the 1st of July, the new marketing year started. And the number is that we exported one point, uh, almost one uh, million tons of grain. That's July 25. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that Ukrazaliznets, Ukrainian railways, they said that they uh, will be able to export not more than 1 million within the months, if everything is fine-tuned. The rest will come through the ports that are very small ones on the Danube River that were closed. And for you, uh, let me remind you that uh, these uh, ports have had a, a massive uh, uh, line, so to say, or traffic jam of the ships once Ukraine has freed up the Snake Island because it opened up another strait, another access to the port, and a lot of those ships that were trying to load the grain came there. So it shows how much trust the world companies, the logistical companies, and the Western world has to Ukraine and how little it has towards Russia. And it moves, the same conclusion is, can be done from uh, the nearest uh, uh, developments after this, the treaty, the grain treaty was signed. But I'll talk about it a little later. So this is the breakdown of what was exported within this marketing year. Not much, but this, these are the crops that are most interesting for the farmers to be sold abroad, that they, that they make most sense. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we have the data, full data over the past months, June. So 2.17 million tons, 1 million is railway and the rest is, are the ports and their trucks. Business is trying to adjust, but with the new harvest coming, it's not going to happen without losses uh, uh, because uh, the, we dramatically lack the storage facilities. <clears throat> the new breverbs. Uh, there are three ports. There were small ports, and they usually transport the grain towards the North Sea. So it, in July, 1.3 tons, uh, million tons, is uh, um, expected. To, to have export, to, to export. Uh, that's the total number and 50% through the new ports. 30% is railway and uh, 20 road transport. Uh, there are huge lines, huge queues of the transport at the borders. And uh, uh, to some extent, uh, drivers stand there a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm, I'm not mentioning the trains that need to re be uh, the cars need to be reassembled to a new chassis. It's uh, some, uh, there were claims that uh, it took over a month uh, in some cases. 
and the grain of I course mean, is losing its quality so uh number? since the beginning of the war ukrainian you railway station uh, i'm sorry could you please turn off the microphone yep yeah okay so i mentioned that maximum that they can do according to what their official claimed uh two by weeklies before it will be one million right now it is closing it is ex uh, much more closer i'm, I'm mistaken to, at the beginning claiming that they have already reached one million no it's only 0.8 but still more than it was at the beginning 0.4 <clears throat> so the agreement the agreement uh, was signed and you've read about that you know that uh, it was signed there was a lot of uh, opinions whether it is for good or for the bad let's let me explain you uh, let, 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 let me start speaking from the most important part uh, which will affect uh, the world if the ports are open first of all the countries will get the food and they will manage to uh, a lot of people will manage to survive and their political stability will <clears throat> persist in the countries that depend so much upon the, our food secondly if the uh, exportation uh, starts working through these three ports uh, we will be able to reload our agricultural industry and we will be able to uh, help uh, Ukrainian currency and Ukrainian economy uh, uh, greatly. Of course, the world prices will uh, go down a little bit, but uh, although we have noticed uh, uh, in the first couple of days after the treaty was signed, five to six percent drop for the futures on the commodities uh, that Ukraine can export massively, uh, uh, then after they shot uh, into Odessa port, uh, there were a lot of talks that no insurance companies will be willing to insure the ships coming into these three ports. Two of them, by the way, must be opened, were promised to be opened by the end of this week. So today or tomorrow maximum. And one uh, southern uh, port, which is actually located most to the north, uh, will be reopened uh, on Monday. So <clears throat> there, uh, it was just a couple of days ago, of official uh, statements that so far there are no uh, understanding of what the insurance will be. But it can be so high that uh, companies will be reluctant to come in. And those who are first, they take most risk. Everybody understands that especially after United Nations claimed that uh, the treaty that they made, uh, that they uh, participated in, treaty between Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, and United Nations, does not stop Russia from shelling the uh, facilities uh, and uh, military facilities and other uh, than uh, port facilities or uh, the ships so in other words there is no security so these are the numbers of uh, the uh, forecasted exports uh, that these ports can handle however how it will work no one knows so far as far as i know there hasn't been any ship loaded in any of those ports but i know that Two of them are ready that that is uh, ready to work that was proved uh, to me by the people uh, there in odessa oblast <clears throat> so uh, there is uh, this entity that is going to be monitoring how things are happening uh, there were a lot of talks that ukraine has uh, uh, compromised which uh, and that compromise might result in uh, worsening of the war situation for ukraine but there is very one very important notion. If Ukraine said, no, we do not negotiate with Russia their ability to export, not only the economy would suffer, but also our reputation worldwide. Russia would definitely use it, this fact that uh, Ukraine is 
deliberately creating artificial starvation worldwide, although it is in fact they who are creating, but they will blame it on us, just like they blame on us that they destroyed, that they bombed their barracks this night. This is their strategy and the world knows uh, how they, uh, how they, how Russia works. Therefore, Ukraine signed this agreement. And according to some opinions that I've met, it was an astonishment for Russia because they were able, they were preparing to be using this argument, but now Ukraine signed it. And those opinions uh, holders, they said that that's why Russia bombed Odessa port because they needed to uh, break this agreement. They by no means want this grain to be at the market through the Ukrainian ports, through the Ukrainian side. They want to sell it themselves. Therefore, they were trying, uh, started to, to try uh, to uh, stop this, uh, uh, this agreement uh, this way. The fact is that this agreement is one agreement where all sides signs, signed and this coordination center is one table where all the sides sit. This is probably not something that Ukraine likes, but any agreement requires uh, steps uh, from both sides, from all the sides uh, to uh, compromise. Therefore, we compromise here, Russia compromised according to some opinions more in, in what we can see now. But uh, let, let us see whether it is going to work or not. Hopefully it will. This is the coordination center. This is how the sides look. You see the Russian side, the Ukrainian side. The route. The route that is going to be taken uh, requires passing through two straits. Bosphorus and Dardanelles in order to enter the uh, world markets. Uh, on the way here from, the, from these uh, ports, the area close to the shores is not going to be demined fully. There will be created some routes that allow ships to come through safely but majority of the territory will be still mined by Ukrainian side, the closest territory to here. Russians are not going to come in to Ukrainian territory. No Russian uh, representative is going to be in the port. Instead, uh, they may, in uh, uh, conjunction with the United Nations or Turkey, mainly it is to be done by Turkey, but uh, these ships, when coming in, before coming in, will be inspected by Turkey and Russians or by United Nations and Russians for the presence of weapon there, because it might deliver weapon in, uh, inside in back and get the uh, grain back. And this is very interesting because that's what Russians are actually doing. They lack trucks to bring ammunition to Kherson and to these regions where they are fighting, but they are uh, uh, hauling grain from here by the trucks. And when the trucks return, they come in with weapons, with uh, ammunition to, uh, to the military. And these trucks look like, not, of course, not like the military ones, but they look like these white ones that bring uh, humanitarian aid or uh, which are just used for grain hauling. So uh, they suspect that others will be doing what they do themselves. And this is not, my, not only my observation. Here I'm talking about what was published in the articles, uh, in the investigations, some of these uh, journals and uh, uh, media, they succeeded contact, contacting people, farmers in those areas, and that's coming from them. So three ports, Odessa, Chernomorsk, and Pivdeny, which is in Russian language, Yuzhny. You see here, Yuzhny, it is the most southern, most northern, then Odessa and Chernomorsk. So these three ports, they face uh, the uh, sea and uh, because Mikulayev and Kherson, those are three, uh, two ports that, uh, and Olvia, uh, they are on the Dnieper River. But here, these are coming directly into the sea. So this is the result of the attack. 
Luckily, no grain storage uh, was damaged, but still. It happened right after the agreement, and according to some opinions, it made a very bad uh, reputation for Mr. Erdogan, the president of uh, Turkey, because it was he who negotiated the discount 25% for his grains, but in return, he was supposed to provide safety and their warships and one are currently coming into uh, uh, Black Sea uh, to ensure that everything is working fine uh, and that their uh, cargo ships will be secured. So uh, this is a, like a um, slap over the face for the President Erdogan by uh, Putin by Russia. Some, some opinions claim. Here is the capacity of those ports. Why it is important? Because some of the people are actually uh, claiming that all, and now we know the number, 18 million metric ton of grain can be exported through these ports within one month to month and a half. These ports, they have been working mainly with uh, uh, all sorts of cargo, including grain. And you will not be able to load the grain with uh, the equipment that is meant to be load the containers unless the grain is in the container. That's why there are limits. And you can see that the capacity uh, uh, is, uh, of, of each of the ports uh, for grain is limited. Okay, I see the question here. Uh -huh, okay. <clears throat> So this is the port capacity through the year. And this, this is what they were able to export before the war in one month. Okay, I, will, I need to proceed quicker because I've taken one hour already. So these are the dirty tricks of Russia that they uh, signed a treaty, but in fact, they don't want this treaty to start working because they will lose the opportunity to blackmail the world and to uh, uh, sell this grain themselves. Again, we've had that in the past. They've used food as the leverage or the influence to blackmail the world and to especially to influence Ukrainians. We've lived through that and we will live through that this time too. That's what we have in our genes uh, to fight back the Russians' aggression. So we are talking about uh, 400 million people being fed by Ukrainian commodities worldwide before the war. That was when the agricultural industry was not fine-tuned. It was working just uh, as a developing industry and uh, numbers were rising every year. Our calculation is that it can feed up to 600 million people if everything works perfect because there is still a lot to learn and there are a lot of technologies that uh, if uh, applied massively in Ukraine can increase their uh, yield, their uh, yields and of course the effectiveness of production. As a result, uh, if those technologies are applied fully by the 2030, that's not our estimate. That's uh, of course coming from the uh, specialists, but it can reach up to billion. So let's uh, take the most modest calculations. <clears throat> the small family farms, and these are the farmers uh, which we face in, which we target in our world to rebuild rural Ukraine project. Uh, they produce 30% of crops and 40% of animal produce. So remember, I told you, spring crops are planted for the sake to feed their swine, their uh, cattle, and chicken. So uh, they sell milk, eggs, meat towards the market. <clears throat> and it is dramatical, 40%. They farm, for you to understand, out of those 70 million acres, again, about 28 to 32%. So let's make it 30%. Uh, according to our observations, when uh, Dmitro Kalitka, our project coordinator, went to Kiev Oblast, uh, to inspect these villages that suffered Russian aggression, every 10th farm in general, statistically, 
was badly damaged so that it cannot function. So taking 10% from the ability, from, the, from what these people were feeling, we end up in 20 to 60, 20, 12 to 16 million of people. 12, it's uh, before the war when we had 400 million, uh, 400 million being fed by Ukraine, uh, Ukraine grain commodities and 16 if it is 600 million. Here are these farmers, huge corporations, private farmers, small farmers, family farms and peasants, if you may. Here are the numbers what they produce. Potatoes, about 90% of potatoes, this is their production. We have developed this program in order to support these people. And right now I'm finishing the um, trip with my family in the United States of America that lasted 100 days. And that was supposed to promote our uh, program, to promote the goals that we are trying to uh, meet. And of course, to speak up, to speak out about the problems in the agricultural area because agricultural industry and especially small agricultural industry because the newspapers are showing mainly their problems in the uh, uh, military in the in the cities and in economy but hardly any any paper speaks about the smallest farmers export yes they mention it because it influences the world but not the smallest farmers let me uh, conclude here uh, with uh, the uh, video that I prepared for you uh, to um, uh, report on what we have done. And I must admit that I'm, uh, I like the result of our trip and it is just the beginning. It will last for years, unfortunately. And fortunately, with your support, we will be able to help these people. And uh, uh, all that we do right now is to promote and to support this uh, this program. Just one and a half minute video, and then we will proceed to our guests. We are speaking today with two guests, a farmer and a company that is creating farmers. So a lot of interesting things still to come. These are the states that we have worked in over these hundred days. We've met with uh, members of Congress and Senate. We've uh, actually worked in 14 states, but more than 30 states we passed through. Thank you all, everyone. I will not be able to uh, name all the names right now who have been kind to support us, to host us and to develop the program for us. But we and my family will always remember this time here as a very kind and very sympathetic uh, side of uh, United States of America. And on our side, we can promise that we will make sure these efforts of yours and of ours will result in a maximum uh, outcome uh, meeting our goals in Ukraine. Like I say, this is just the beginning because there are a lot of those who need our help and uh, a lot of those uh, who are counting on us. So far, we have collected $21,000 and we have pre-identified three aid recipients. I have already written an email to the ambassadors because this is how we work. We do not spend any penny without, amb without ambassadors improvement, improvement. And we are going to start uh, the reconstruction for those families. Uh, but we are not going to stop the uh, bi-weeklies and the efforts to help those people, uh, even when we uh, work as the commercial company uh, uh, organizing the tours. So uh, right now we have here um, Roman Horobets and Maxim Schweitz. Uh, Maxime, uh, if you allow me, I will give the word to Roman first so that we no proceed problem. proceed uh, from farming to from actual farmers to more uh, to the businesses. Uh, Romane, are you there? Roman Horobets. Check, check. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, good, good. Hello, nice to see you. Uh, video is a little bit slower, but we can see you very well. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I do. The sound is uh, slowing down, but uh, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, it is showing that you have a poor connection. Probably uh, video might be considered for stopping, to be stopped if it goes very bad. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, Roman, could you please uh, share with uh, the audience here uh, the real situation or the most unique challenges that were uh, over the last five months and how you succeeded uh, to uh, tackle them. Can you, can you hear all, me? Yes, I do. Yeah, good. I can hear you. First of all, uh, everybody. it's a very pleasure to me to to speak to you, to all of you, and long time to see you, Roman. Very nice to see you as well. Okay, so uh, obviously challenges, there are many challenges we have faced since the beginning of war. Uh, but the most important, I think, uh, shortages in supply. Uh, However, I, I don't think it's going to be that much interesting to me for, to, for me to describe. As I know, we were... Uh, uh, so we basically, were I wanted about, to start to tell... I'm sorry for interruption. Uh, we were told by the... Uh, actually, we had the information coming out in the media that about 60 to 70% was the general supply for the spring uh, production season. Uh, in... Uh, fuel, in seeds, in fertilizers, in the crop protection materials. Is that right? 60 to 70 or it was even worse? Are we speaking about Ukraine, Ukraine in general or about my farm? Uh, let's say about your farm, your location. And by the way, please mention what, what is the size, what you produce and where? Because this is something that I know, but not the audience. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, my farm is located in southwestern part of Poltava region, very close to Dnipro River, to the biggest uh, uh, Dnipro River reservoir, which is Kremenčutske Vodoshovesche. So you can uh, easily find us out by uh, just looking at the map, and uh, the biggest reservoir will be our area. Uh, in, under our operation, uh, roughly around 5,500 uh, acres, which is, is uh, something about 2,000 hectares. And, um, and we grow basic crops like uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, sunflower, I play that one. and some chickpeas. Uh, so speaking about uh, shortages, uh, my farm is rather exception and we do manage to uh, get all of the inputs in advance. Uh, we start to plan around uh, November, uh, actually around October, and we uh, sign majority of our contracts with uh, suppliers uh, during November and December. And we also prepay for majority of our uh, goods, for our supply, for our inputs. Uh, 2021 wasn't uh, exception. So we did manage to get uh, all of our seeds in place, all of our fertilizers in place, all of our chemicals in place. Uh, what we had uh, some, we had to purchase some diesel uh, during the war. So diesel was uh, kind of an issue, even though we had some uh, uh, some diesel in stock. But uh, after sowing campaign, uh, planting campaign, uh, we ran out of diesel, and uh, um, of course we. 
we started to think in advance and we pre-ordered some diesel from the European Union and uh, it's been delivered within uh, 50 days. So we didn't have any interruption in our production. Did you and, have to change um, your crops that you were planning to, uh, the acres for the crops that you were planning at the beginning of the uh, year? To, did, did you need to adjust the uh, structure of the crops as we call it in Ukraine? As long as we got all of our inputs in place before war started, we didn't do any changes. Good. For you, ladies and gentlemen, to understand, uh, Roman represents the area that is not <clears throat> affected by the land uh, war, by the war that was coming through the land. The only, uh, which is various serious uh, danger are the missiles that are coming from the sky but not like it is in Kherson Oblast or in uh, Sumy or Chernihiv Oblast okay what about the sale of the commodities uh, what's the situation for you right now Roman I would like to speak about uh, previous months because mm -hmm. right now obviously we are are not selling anything and the uh, reason is uh, since the beginning of war uh, okay before war started there were a lot of signs that Russians are gonna um, make an invasion so uh, we sold all of our uh, corn and uh, most of our wheat we had some uh, wheat in storage uh, at the day the war started, just because we had issues with the uh, pests and uh, we decided to fumigate the storage. So that's why we didn't sell it in time. But when the war started, we immediately, when the war began, we immediately started to uh, searching for uh, traders who can buy all of our leftover goods and we did manage to sell our soybeans during uh, March and we managed to sell our uh, sunflower seeds and uh, uh, remaining of winter wheat during April. Uh, therefore we got a quite good price range for that comparing to to what it is trading right now, we we got twice as much in terms of price. Of course, for many pe people who are sitting on their stocks, the, they are suffering drastically right now because they are selling, um, right now they are selling almost at the break-even point or even lower the break-even point. So we didn't do it because we did understand that uh, uh, you know the war it, it is a war it's going to be brutal and uh, um, I had a lot of doubts that Russians will uh, take our region over because we are basically in the middle of uh, Ukraine and for them to to proceed through whole of Ukraine it's going to be a huge challenge and also, if they did so, I think they they would probably uh, think what they should do in order to maintain stability on the area they just took over. And uh, I think their focus to, uh, would have been how to uh, collaborate with locals and to, to keep stability because, he, you know, from Which the is, standpoint of the invader, uh, if you got, pardon? Which is not happening right now in Kherson. I mean, they, they're not succeeding to uh, find a common language with the people there. And there is there are, of course, there are uh, collaborators, but uh, there are only a few of them. They counted, they were expecting much more support of what they're doing. Uh, I'm just showing the map yeah, here. So, so, so this is Globina, this is where you are located, right? 
Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Everybody, uh, this map is in Ukrainian, so I will translate for you. Here is Kharkiv, and that is the border with Russia. Here is Dnipro, that's another central uh, oblast, uh, but Zaporizhia, and uh, by the way, here is Nikopol I mentioned. Unfortunately, they can reach it uh, with artillery through the uh, river. That's Mykolaiv, and that's Odessa. So here is where Roman is farming, literally, almost literally in the central part of Ukraine. Roman, can you tell me, please, uh, what about their uh, people and the ability to go into the fields? Did you have enough employers to uh, fulfill all the necessary uh, work in the fields? Yes, we do have enough uh, employees. Uh, even though some of them were taken to go to the battlefield, but uh, it, it wasn't, uh, it didn't make a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, we, we just optimized our processes and uh, you know, it didn't affect us. Okay, the, so we I, can easily I, go I can to, to the field and do all of the operations. I can say is that you, in your case is more of a success story. Some optimism that uh, can be brought to uh, the the total situation uh, in in Ukraine right now. And good good that uh, uh, there are stories like that because. Uh, mm, it brings others, it gives uh, more uh, emotional strength for the others to, to fight back. What would be the most uh, maybe uh, difficult for you this time, this, uh, over this uh, part of the season uh, to go through? What would you like to mention as the most outstanding challenge? Roman? So this year, is uh -huh. uh, yes can you hear me yes yes mm -hmm. so the this year is not like previous years because we had uh, two years in a row to, uh, in a row of uh, drought and uh, our yield uh, in 2020 was terrible and in 2021 was just bad, bad. so uh, during this year uh, we had some heat waves during uh, June, but starting from the second uh, half of June till this day, we've received uh, five times precip precipitation that we normally get. So uh, we just managed to harvest uh, half of our um, winter wheat and we didn't even start to uh, uh, harvest in uh, spring barley. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and uh, yield, yield, is, yield is not that good because of heat waves at the end mm -hmm. of uh, May and beginning of uh, June. But, but still, you know, Everything is working and uh, everything is okay. Of course, the, the main problem will be funds because uh, right now, uh, considering two previous years of drought, we didn't have like bunch of grain in, in stocks. So that's why we need to um, eat up our savings and uh, make Basically, you know, everything you made through these years, you just put up front to fulfill your expenses, to get everybody in place. And, uh, you know, you don't know what's going to be next. That's, that's very rightly said. You don't know, but uh, so far, uh, what has been happening uh, brings some optimism into the season and into the um, uh, military situation. They say that uh, uh, this August will be very remarkable in the military standpoint of view. 
we hope that it will be remarkable for the for Ukrainian side. Uh, thank you, Roman, very much for your uh, inform for sharing your information. Good luck with the prices and with the uh, continuation of good uh, weather. As they say, the God is helping, and then Mother Nature understands uh, uh, what's uh, right, what's wrong, supporting the right side. All, please tell hi to all your family, and I hope they all are safe and uh, so good. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I wanted to tell you last few sentences because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think my speech uh, <laughs> has a little bit pessimistic mood, but uh, it's not what's going on up here because we believe in our uh, army, we believe in our forces and all, all of the countries who are supporting us. And uh, that what uh, keeps us uh, here in place, what motivates us to do what, what we are doing right now. And that, you, you know, we actually purchased a lot of uh, uh, fertilizers and seeds for, for our uh, fall sowing campaign. So basically we are all set. We only need some diesel and that's it. So that's why we believe in future and we're trying to invest in uh, inputs up front. So the, that's why, you know, we are Ukrainians, we live in Ukraine, we believe in our strength and we believe in the uh, support of our friends. Allies, yep, truly. And thankful, thankful for any help that is coming. Yeah, sure. And thank you very much for hosting such an, an event. Yeah, we are doing, each of us is doing what we can. Somebody is doing more, somebody is doing less, but all is for the good side of things. And as I keep saying, uh, we will be great to welcome anyone who's on the other side of screens right now to show you how Ukraine beautiful can be in the peaceful times. And Roman's farm will be one of the locations if they, uh, uh, if they don't find it first. Yeah, of right course, we, we invite uh, everybody to visit our farm. We are experienced in uh, uh, hosting uh, guests. So just during the peaceful time, don't hesitate to stop by. Okay. Thank you very much, Roman. Like I said, tell uh, all our warm hearts to, highs to family. And good luck to you with the season, with everything. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to shift to our next guest, uh, Maxim Schwedt. Uh, he is uh, one who is, they have the same goals as we do, helping the small family farms, but their focus is on dairy, so animal production. If you remember, these small farms in Ukraine, they produce total up to 45, 40 to 45 percent of the produce, of the animal produce. and. Uh, much of it is actually coming from the dairy. Uh, Maxim, can you share the, your screen? Yes, yes, I can. Yes, in, in case you will okay. have me, uh, give me the right. Ah, uh, you don't, uh, Andrei. I need, uh, I need, please, I need, could, I need could your you permission, give... yes, because you're yeah, administrator. Co-host. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I have shifted the host to Andrei because at this point I need to be leaving and Andrei Nabuchotny will be finishing today's meeting with you. Uh, Maxim, uh, yeah. please go ahead. You can take as much time as uh, the audience likes. Uh, your, uh, the, the thing, the matter that you are going to be presenting is very important. And uh, that's why I had no doubts by uh, joining uh, you uh, to our program. And we will uh, combine our um, uh, forces and our uh, all what we do towards this effort. Unfortunately, I'm traveling right now. I'm at yes. the airport and I need I need to be leaving. But uh, it's not the today's session is not yet left uh, ended. Okay, so, it's, it's, um, it's it's not the it's not the last one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's very right. Yeah, uh, I'm very I'm very thankful for you. Just maybe five seconds. Very thankful for you. Just that, uh, and I that I have got also the opportunity to to join because that maybe not the first the first session but not the last 
it's it's uh, definitely really not the last cool, yes. <laughs> cool new cool news yes but i'm uh, i'm very thankful for you just and have a good flight and um, i hope Thank that we will uh, will continue with some practical projects uh, yep. helping farmers yeah. we definitely will thank you very much uh andre please uh, uh take over from here and thank you the audience next time we are speaking about corn uh, my travel is one of the reasons I decided to postpone the corn production uh, topic for the, uh, from this bi-weekly to the next one, because we want to devote utmost attention to this crop and we will be doing a three or even four side uh, in uh, interview or dialogue about corn production in two weeks from now. Uh, so far, we continue. Andrei Nabuchotny is the host right now and Maxim Schweitz is going to present the program that is very important from the animal standpoint of view. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, yes. My name is uh, uh, Maxim. Uh, maybe just it's shorter and better to uh, say Max. Uh, and I really just want uh, to show and present you the project and uh, the idea that we have now within our project in Ukraine, helping small dairy farms uh, to to survive, to, uh, to be sustainable in that hard time. And uh, uh, it is called industrial land lease. Uh, I borrowed uh, the term, in, term land lease from, uh, you know, famous land, land lease program that uh, was adopted in the United States by the government. And, uh, but that, that is only concentrated on in, in industrial part and only on family dairy farms. So uh, as for the project, uh, oh, just is it any everything oak with presentation and sound, Andre? Yes, it is all perfect. Oh, that's that's fine. So the well. project is what's what about the project? So we are uh, I'm representing the company Ukrainian Invest. We are the project company in the Riven region that is um, concentrated on on dairy business, and we in that dairy business we are have experienced more than 10 years uh, and uh, till uh, um, to 2017 uh, we had only the industrial farm but in 2017 just we de uh, uh, designed and uh, decided to launch the project that will help to open uh, small dairy farms in the villages and transform that private households that uh, had one, two cows, three cows, that was not uh, for, for sure uh, uh, not a business into the uh, dairy farms with 10, 20, no, 30 cows that uh, uh, is more likely to be a business for farmer and uh, just uh, they can uh, uh, keep on the family in the village, not, to work, uh, not going to work here on Poland, for example. And that project, uh, 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 already la uh, lasts for five years and uh, we have already opened uh, more than 160 farms uh, till that uh, till that 24th of uh, February. Uh, what is the time scale? Yes, just to have, uh, uh, I have said uh, a little bit uh, about the, uh, about the uh, time schedule but still just in 2017 we opened the first farm in the Riven region it's western part of ukraine uh, in now in a year we have already uh, opened uh, 10 farms more than 40 farms and uh, uh, before the war just in, in 11 region considering also the regions uh, that are now just uh, uh, suf uh, suffered from the uh, from that uh, war uh, consequences and uh, war operation in ten in eleven regions we have already opened one hundred and fifty farms and uh, we had a goal just and and we now actually have a goal uh, to open five thousand to have to open five thousand farm family farms all over Ukraine it's uh, more than one hundred and fifty thousand uh, uh, cows and it's around twenty thousand working places not not exactly working places but maybe it's it's like businesses for for families. It's not like you are a hired worker, but uh, it's your own business. And ten percent of milk market, uh, uh, we are we were planning just to to catch in in five seven years. 
And it's uh, designed and project is running in the form of a dairy cluster concept. Uh, you see that uh, in, in case just yes, we have only the farm that is working uh, without any support, it will uh, uh, it will be suffering just uh, and is this suffering from lack of uh, resources, lack of high first feed and uh, lack of veterinary services. So we uh, managed to make uh, a, a kind of uh, cluster uh, uh, well, uh, around the farm, there is the infrastructure that is helping them just to to work. Just we we are supplying them with the feed feed with hyphers, uh, with veterinary services. Uh, uh, we have uh, training centers that is helping to teach and and uh, to develop farmers. Uh, now, just in the project, uh, we also. Um, with with in the partnership with the farmers, we uh, have launched uh, two craft uh, procession uh, units. And the project idea is that it should be not not, not like maybe cooperative, but cluster that is helping uh, farmers uh, to move to move on. So about the project today, uh, some more words. Uh, it's around as I said, it's around 167 farms. Now 101 farm. Under construction, we also have applications uh, that we are now putting, uh, we have put on pause because of that uh, lack of resources and uh, uh, and uh, uh, that influence of war. And also, just uh, in the project, we have launched in 2020 a kind of crowd investing platform, and 405 investors. Uh, it's just mere Ukrainian people. Uh, uh, and also some some uh, uh, foreigners from Germany and from Indonesia uh, have invested uh, from in, in our project uh, around 101 million dollars. So, so the project now just is open for for different uh, and it's our core values that we are open to a lot of stakeholders and uh, we are just very trans transparent in uh, uh, reporting in, in what is going on with the project. So, so that is just the idea as of May, just uh, 22, we have you know, we have such a picture and, and 40 farms are in the air or close to, to hostilities. Uh, and what do I want to say is that also just uh, to be more or less optimistic in, uh, in, in my uh, presentation that uh, uh, war, the war uh, has proved also the sustainability of project. I, I, I'm sure that Roman uh, showed you that uh, statistics on milk industry and uh, that uh, consequences that in uh, huge industrial farms um, have uh, uh, experienced uh, now just uh, because of because of lack of feed or or even just uh, physical intrusion into the farm. But our small farms are more flexible than industrial. And they are not so so interested for occupants uh, as as we uh, see on some examples now just uh, within the project. And we are not dependent on large land plots, and we are not dependent on such um, huge need of resources because small farm has his uh, uh, own uh, has its own uh, uh, um, small land. Uh, uh, land area just for production for of feed or or just we can su supply them with the feed and uh, we also ha has have the possibility of craft procession and so so on div diver diversify because industrial farm they need just to supply on the on huge uh, uh, dairy plant but we can make uh, the small craft procession what is we are doing now just and lower energy risk for also, but still they we also have the problem with fuel, with less electricity, less gas, but uh, with fuel as well. Just but it's lower than than an industrial one because we also have in that now just have industrial farm as well. And uh, comparing to small far farms, uh, they are more in uh, um, in uh, they're in a better position than the industrial one. What are the challenges of the project? We, uh, it's uh, for, first of all, it's critical lack of finance for small, small. They're all, all just government programs. They are directed on supporting bigger farmers, uh, but uh, for dairy, for small dairy farms, uh, the critical lack of finance from banks, from from state. Now, just we are 
in the severe situation with with that financial sources uh, decrease of prices uh, in the peak uh, uh, of uh, in the peak just in in may or or in march the prices uh, <clears throat> prices uh, uh, had dropped maybe two times in in some regions I'm sorry now just they are more or less on the market level but, but still just it's now just uh, the uh, the market of dairy plants not not dairy farmers uh, uh, and it's a pity and problem with logistics i think that uh, roman uh, described vividly what is going on uh, on the market with uh, with roots uh, trucks and and so on and so forth and deficit of cows and heifers for sure just enter uh what what we experienced uh uh not long ago just uh, the shortage of vet veterinary medicines because you see maybe just 80 percent we used uh, for treating cows healing cows uh, uh, they were just uh, uh importing medicines and uh, that those problems with logistics imp impacted Greatly. Axel, can you please reload the presentation because we can see only your first slide oh yeah <laughs> yes sorry maybe maybe in that way uh, just, you are just, you forget now, just... To, but you have it okay now it's all okay just don't forget yeah, yes because because yes uh, uh, it, uh, sometimes just uh, there are such problems so just uh, you see uh, maybe maybe just i will then uh, come come through the presentation just and show you what just what I told you about the farms and and I I think that the presentation was uh will be distributed and um sure, I will, sure. I will we, we will uh, put it together with the yeah uh, yes, yes. Of the video I hope I hope that I hope that it will be distributed and you will see that uh, what is written but I I may be told everything on that topic and what are the challenges and what now just we are looking looking at because you see that that lack, lack of resources lack, lack of um, equipment machinery and veterinary medicines uh, that we are uh, we now uh, experience yes uh, uh, moved us to to, to think that uh, uh, we need to to launch something different uh, that is now just discussing in the support of Ukraine and we did, we launched uh, such a program like industrial land lease and we're looking for uh, we have um, uh, we have gathered what is the need of from our farmers located not only just uh, in uh, uh, in a region in war regions but also in the, the western part part of Ukraine it, and uh, uh, exactly just now we have around 121 farms we can uh finish and uh, also increase the supply of milk uh, also supply of milk for for army just uh, and we need uh, we need the uh, equipment and machinery i will not i will not stop uh, in details on what kind of machinery and equipment it will be in the presentation to in, in in some in in some um, uh, for example in some cases uh, these farms are are uh, fini uh, are finished uh, maybe on eighty percent in some cases it's on thirty percent but we need such equipment and machinery then we need to also we uh, as I told just to, we have um, already lo launched uh, uh, one production of now just uh, it's already two. Uh, to production of craft cheese and craft milk products and we have an opportunity to open three more craft cheese productions each around one ton of milk per day procession and we need also just that equipment for equipment for that craft procession not not like a for huge dairy but for for small dairy uh, dairy plant uh, also uh, as for the energy safety it's a crucial point especially so we are looking for for the problems energy with energy that can uh, come with the winter and uh, but the cow should be milked every day in for us electric and electro energy and fuel it's just key components in the production process and that is why as uh, we thought about the solutions and uh, the solutions can be the settlement of solar panels and the diesel generators for small farms not not 
not as for the solar panels uh uh no one farm has it now but as for diesel uh some of the farms uh, have but still it can be a, a kind of a kind of solution for energy energy uh energy safety problem and what is what are uh, what can be for example the variants of support uh we uh, tried to we tried to make some suggestions hypothesis there that what can be the the variance uh, to cooperate with uh, uh, american uh, farmers american uh, associations maybe just pro merely investors or or <laughs> any other people just and also we we are trying just to present it on on different levels uh uh we have already launched launch, uh, in canada in poland uh, such projects and trying to, to negotiate and communicate it can be direct leasing program it can be uh not new equipment and also can be a, a kind of decision what to do with write-off and second-hand equipment in the country and it can be long-term leasing more than 10 years with grace with some grace period uh, equal to to wartime uh uh, <clears throat> uh duration and we can we can work directly with the project or in case it it can be even globally not only our project but all dairy farmers uh, in ukraine we can work through the farmer support farm it's state far uh, state fund uh, that is just governed by ministry of agriculture and we can also make a program on the national level and uh, it can be a long-term leasing program or it can be donation and grants uh, a special grants program for family farmers uh family to family support I, I, just we try to we had a bad brainstorming and uh, had an idea of, so american family can support the exact family in ukraine the family family uh in in any village in any area just in can direct support uh we have a donation platform uh, i'm you know, that is why I'm hoping that presentation will be shared. And you see that there is a project on uh, well-known uh, crowdfunding program, GoFundMe. This is ex exactly uh, uh, it's like targeting project uh, for for finishing the construction for one farm in uh, in our Rivn region. But now, just the uh, that family, just in our Rivn region, uh, they try to host uh, uh, families from uh, from um, eastern region, from Mariupol, from Kharkiv. And uh, there is a project directly on GoFundMe. And it's very, uh, very, uh, very useful and very convenient for you just to, to start uh, supporting dairy farmers uh, going on, on, uh, going on, uh, on GoFundMe. Uh, and it can be loan financing as well. Just uh, actually, we have um, within the project, within the cluster, uh, our own credit union that uh, was created uh, uh, for farmers' needs, and it can be direct financing or, or, or through the uh, farmer support fund or any state bank that I told you. It can be loan financed. Uh, it's not like you see that I'm not to, uh, uh, talking about the humanitarian help directly, but it can be, we, we uh, can uh, for sure just uh, have it uh, not like humanitarian help, but uh, like loan or leasing and, and uh, with the payback uh, uh, conditions. Yes, and I think that it can be, it can be more like uh, more uh, uh, interesting for uh, for guys from America just to to start or to launch uh, such program support uh, for Ukrainian dairy farmers. So that is all with the presentation. I try to be in time, maybe shorten something, some information uh, again and again. Just if I'm hoping that you will be able. Uh, to get acquainted with this just more uh, thoroughly after after that. My contact also here, I'm just represented the project here, just like strategy and director. And thank you very much. And thank you for your presence and for your support and uh, for the support from the whole United, United States. And I'm very glad, I'm very glad to be here today. And I'm, 
once again, I'm very thankful to Roman that uh, he included us in in that in that program. And I'm in case of any questions, and in case I can uh, give more information on that, I'm very uh, <clears throat> I'm very glad to answer it and to provide more details on the project. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Maxim. Uh... I will download the presentation to the website in the Facebook page uh, so people who wanted to see the first slides will have more time to look it through and learn about your project. I'm personally also come from Rivne region and I like the presentation you uh, presented today and like the diary business. Uh, so I wish you good luck. I wish you also, good luck to your project. I, in these days, this is extremely important to have projects like that. And I hope uh, today's attendance of the conference and the meeting will share this inf information with uh, their connections. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Everybody, please share information about uh, the project WWRU. And uh, so, so, so more people get up to date information about the situation in Ukraine with a focus on uh, farming, agribusiness. I think there are so many people in the United States, in Canada, and Australia, in the English speaking world who would love uh, to visit all our bi weekly meetings. See you in two weeks. Uh, stay safe and thank you, everybody. Goodbye.